know, I'm a big fan of chess history and preserving it. And I met Oren Porat at the Vegas International Chess Festival, and he told me about his grandfather. And I'd like to share a couple of games and his story. I'd also like to note that uh, Oren's daughter also plays. And for girls under 12s and in the top five players in the country. So chess is very clearly with this family, and it's neat to see generationally one after the other, great players coming from the same family tree. So Oren told me about Josef Pora, who competed in chess Olympiads 12 times. He won the Palestinian Championship in 1937 and 1940, and the Israeli Championships in 1953, 79, and 63. Porat was awarded the International Master title in 1952. And the first game I'd like to show you, he came face to face with a player whose name I know you will recognize in a tournament in 1968, Robert James Fisher. So this may not be the most critical game or best game. We'll show you, in my opinion, after going through the database, the best game of our player that we're going to be investigating today. But the tenacity to hold against the monster that was Fisher in 1968 takes a lot. And I think much can be said for a player that can hold a game against Bobby when he was in his prime. So let's have a look. So Bobby was playing the aggressive King's Indian that he was known for, and Yosef went with solid Fianchetto setup. And already at this point, Fisher goes for an early sideline, which this is typically a good call against lower-rated players in order to try to mix it up a bit, try to confuse them. If you stay with theory, they can stay with theory. But if you try to force creativity, they give more room to go wrong. But our featured player was up to the challenge and plays the critical continuation. The C pawn is attacked. Need to do something about that. And now C5. So fast forward well over <laughs> 50 years. And we're going to get ourselves into modern theory where Bishop G5 was a recommendation by a Vrook in most recent updates to the Grandmaster Repertoire series where you get something to the effect of Bishop D2. And this knight on A5 in many variations can become an issue. So the bishop is actually well placed on D2. And it should be noted that any sort of knight takes d5 situation is frowned upon as these types of lines, due to multiple reasons here, aren't going to work out very well for black. So coming back to bishop d2, something like a6, white nets the bishop pair, and we get these types of positions where we say, please take the rook on a1 as white gets so much play. You even have in-between moves like this queen e1 again with the issue with the knight on a5 where white has a nagging edge. So a little bit of a historical perspective versus modern day theory. So bishop b2 was played in the main game. Nothing wrong with it, but of course bishop g5, which is difficult to see all the complications. This was a time period of straightforward play. Now we get to prep so much with engines, it's crazy. Queen d7, and a critical moment because black is looking to control h3, so we don't have to worry about that, and then getting the queen eyeing the natural break by black. So black has two breaks in the pawn structure with e6 or b5, but this is a moment in the game where if you're a pause your video type of person, try to figure out best play for white. 
Okay, gave you a moment to pause. It's interesting because normally queen d7 isn't played because the queen is defending the knight. You normally see moves like rook b8, a6, and b5. Since the queen has moved, this is now an opportunity to potentially prove that knight on a5 to be a liability. In the main game, queen d3 was played. The best move is actually queen d2, though, in order to keep an x-ray eye on this knight. Whereas, for instance, a6, knight d1, very flexible. One, getting the bishop eye open. Two, looking to play knight e3 to harass this bishop. And three, keeping an eye on this weak knight, forcing a concession move like b6. So queen d2 would have gotten a substantial edge for white and a clear plan. Queen d3 was played, and pretty soon we're already going to see Fisher take the initiative. If you give an inch to a player as strong as Fisher, an elite, they will take a mile from you. So Fisher continues with the plan for a b5 break. Yosef slams in the center, e4, gains some space, b5, and now the chaos begins. Grab and not take back immediately, but c4. Fisher shows his textbook uncompromising style and willingness to take risks to get the full point with black. b takes c4 was played. Now, material has been given and a target has been laid out. So now takes rook fc8 and Fisher has fully equalized at this point. So lots of accurate moves need to be played by white here. First and foremost, the best way to handle the c-pawn issue is to do a give back. As black wants to keep the c-file open, captures with the rook, and this gives time for a move like knight a4. Better would have been bishop a3 with the idea of simplifying into this type of game where this is balanced. More than likely everything's going to trade now in a very Binko Gambit style structure. But knight a4 was played. White still has the bishop pair, but are the bishops that strong when the center is locked in this way? The bishops have no scope, therefore black has easier play. Only thing that is hurting black is that knight on a5. b4. And now a critical moment after rook a b1. It was not often Fisher missed things in his games, especially from a tactical basis. And here, I think, Fisher saw the idea, but wanted to prepare it a bit more he plays queen c8, but objectively, the best way to go is knight takes e4, because this is completely winning on the spot here. As, for instance, rook takes b4, if bishop takes g7, easy to see there, and if knight takes e4, we have bishop takes d4, so in either case, this would have been a winning combination, but for whatever reason, Fisher did not pounce on knight takes e4. But it does show that he was looking at the idea, because after queen c8, and this may have been playing too quickly, distracted, something, rook fc1, he does play knight takes e4 there. So he was clearly looking at the idea. Maybe it was one of those, I'm just going to make a move to improve, and as soon as he released the queen... We've all had those moments that when you release the piece, you see what you should have done. You're playing with too much stress and tension is what that is a sign of. Maybe something like that occurred with Fisher. Never know. So knight takes e4 is played. Now after takes, the in-between move knight c5, which was key in the other combination as well. Takes. And overall... We've got a good knight versus bad bishop because of that pawn on d5. And this should be 
a very difficult position to hold against a superior player. We'll see how we did it. Knight e4. Try to get rid of one of those knights. Should be two. Clip, clip. And White's had tenacious defense so far. Queen f5. Takes, takes. And now we have knight versus bishop ending with the queens. Pretty pure. And it's instructive how white was able to hold this. Queen e2, hitting the e7 pawn. So king f8. Now g5, Fisher looking to use the majority and put a clamp on the structure on the king side. Just keeping an eye on key squares. Notice that technique, putting the pawns on all the dark squares to keep them away from the bishop. But progress is being made, little by little. King's more flexible on e8, by the way, to go either to d7 or f7. g4. This opens up another avenue of attack. I think trading a set to have one pawn on a light square is a good idea because you could have situations to where you're able to check on the h file and then move to the c file in some way. Or say, in the long term, it's something that after you check on h7, He's being checked when you go to b1, and you can pick up a2. So it leaves the position open for more tactics later. Instead of, say, for instance, keeping it closed and going for this type of structure. So it's interesting to, to think about these types of dynamics, which is why I highlight them. And I agree with Fisher's assessment there. King d8, queen e2. King can't go too far from protection of the e-pawn. F4, trying to prevent the knight from going to E5. It can't fully be prevented. But here, white does not have to take any considerable risk. You can sit, cover the weaknesses. And sometimes in chess, an active plan is not necessarily what is needed. Sometimes you need to be objective and hunker down. If your opponent wants to win so badly, then they're going to need to prove the position. And our historical hero is slowly but surely holding it together against a future world champion. And black just doesn't have any way to make progress, and white is slowly just maneuvering, not doing anything that's going to jeopardize holding the position. And a draw was agreed in this position. Absolutely fantastic defense against Fisher, who was very clearly close to the top of his game in 1968. So our next game, this game really highlights Joseph's abilities. And this is against Gligerich in 1964 in the Amsterdam Interzonal. It's a very important tournament. We see one of my favorite lines, definitely covered from Master of the French Defense. The French! And after Bishop G5, D takes E4. And I was excited when I was going through the database looking at games. It's like, did he play the burn? Did he play the burn? He did not play the burn. These are my favorite lines in the French. He decided to transpose back into the Rubenstein. Also covered that in my text as well. Knight f3, bishop e7, takes. And from a thematic standpoint, the, this was all the rage of the day. h4. Very interesting sideline that was popular in the time period. H6. Very clean play by both sides so far. Opposite side castling situation. And 
here the major issue is the c8 bishop the french bishop is you if you will so we need to fix this guy b6 seems a bit slow e5 black is fully equalized everything is great here takes if black's able to trade queens no problems whatsoever so rook takes and now this was the only blemish on an otherwise perfect game. Knight c5 was played, and white missed a big opportunity soon thereafter. The main line I would give would be knight b6 here. Just to have the c8 bishop into the game, as well as the flexibility of the knight on b6 to help. And the idea is after, say, for instance, bishop d3, c5 c4 being fully willing to give up the pawn in order to get this type of play with queen a6 hitting the rook on c4 hitting the pawn on a2 where black has excellent play and the position is dynamically balanced so that would be a bit of modern theory for you there in the main game knight c5 was played and after bishop c4 Bishop e6. Optically, black looks okay. But white missed a big opportunity here with rook f4. Whereas after queen e7, knight d4, white has excellent winning chances with all the pile up on e6. And according to the engine, white has a substantial advantage. But in the main game, g4 was played by the Famous GM. Now, it's go time. When you're being attacked, what do you do? Simplify. Simplify. Get rid of attackers. Let's clip one. Let's get some pieces into the game. Well, minor pieces are gone. That makes the defensive task easier. And in the meantime, Queen's hitting the rook on h1, so rook g1. Rook a d8, full harmony. Would you like to take any of the pawns? C pawn, a pawn, they're yours. So whose attack is more menacing here? White gets nervous and plays queen f5. If you're a pause your video type of person, like to move, what would you do? Which reminds me of a famous tactic from a Capablanca game. Back rank problems. Queen g2 and our historical hero delivers one of the worst losses with white that Gligerich had in his entire career. So, very nice game from the French defense. And I sincerely appreciate being able to do a video like this and talk to Ord at the tournament at the Vegas International. And if you've got someone in your family that played chess, you've got a neat story or neat game to, to talk about, tell me about it. Send me an email. Happy to do a video like this covering the history because I get to learn something. Hopefully the viewers get to learn something. If you appreciate this type of video, smash that like button. Let me know in the comments. Subscribe if you will, if you already haven't. And uh, love to hear from you. Thanks.